So I'll just go through the basic house and uh, show you what I do and some of the things I found out over time. The first thing that I found out was I started out with normally just a little inch and a half block of wood. So I picked out the side that looked best, drilled my holes. When I go to turn it round, I look at it and I say, well, why in the heck did I drill the holes there? There's better surfaces somewhere else. And then I realized I was working with four surfaces. So now I take and I turn them round and I have 360 choices. So I can turn that any way I want. So to me, it has helped make the house look a lot better because you can position things where you want. Now the burrow, when you're doing it with burrow, um, you just pick out the fanciest grain. But let's say that you're doing it with straight grain wood. Now, if your wood is running this way, the grain in it, when you go to turn this round, you start doing this with the grain. So you take and actually kind of throw a frame around the holes. If you did it this way, that turns up on the sides and this is just straight grain, which I don't think looks near as nice as being uh, framed by that grain. So there's a lot of ways of taking and looking at what you're doing there before you ever get started. When I do turn them around, I just turn them in a cylinder and I take a V-block and clamp it down on my table with the pointer underneath, you know, hitting the center of the V. Once it's clamped, you throw that on there and you've already got the high point, top dead center. So whatever you lay out, it just hit it and you, you've got straight holes. I put a quarter for the large one, I use an eighth for the roost hole. I've got some box elder burl here that I'm going to make it out of. And I'm not going to put any finish on this one because it, when it goes home, my wife is going to take and dye it. I'm going to put a, a three quarter hole in and that's going to start the, uh, the basis of this house. And then I'm going to put a, a 5 eighths hole after that. And the reason being that 5-8 is going to be down here and the 3 quarters is going to be up here. And we can take and turn that house around and finish the back side. So when we start with the 3 quarter, we do not want to hollow or disturb that 3 quarter at all because we're going to continue using that all the way through. Now when I'm done here, I'll probably have to deepen that a little bit, but I'll explain that as I go. Okay, I'm going in and start shaping my house now. Should never move your tool rest with the lathe running. With the hole in it, I can see what I have for a wall thickness to start it. So that gives me a chance to start making my shape. Naturally I will not be able to do the, the bottom because I'm holding it right now. Holding it in where, I'm not, where I have to cut it off. So. When you drill wood, I don't care how careful you are, 
the drill bit is going to go in the direction of least resistance, which is with the grain. So sometimes even with a Forstner bit, it's going to, going to run out. So that's why I'm not worried about this diameter right now. When I turn it around, then I'm on the holes. I'm turning it on the two holes, so then everything will be concentric from then on. But this initial drilling, it could be off. Okay, I'm taking my little quarter-by-quarter quarter round nose, and I'm going in and hollow some of that out. Now, I'm going to put a pencil mark in there, but it's not really not showing, but I'm going to stay about an eighth of an inch away from the end, because I want to maintain that three-quarter diameter hole. reason I put two different diameter holes in there, if I went with a three-quarter all the way, I would limit myself down at the bottom as to what I could do shape-wise. Wall thickness is easy to see, you just look through the hole. Now I've lost most of that five-eighths. And the reason I put the 5 8 down in there, as I come around, I could tell where I was. So I could make the shape of the house kind of can follow the uh, outside diameter. Just a tad more. And I have faced the end off. Everything is clean so that we can jam that up against our roof when the time comes. When I make my jigs or scrap blocks that I reuse or anything that I feel is going to be reused, I mark my jig or my block. In other words, go between two of the jaws and I mark everything. If I take something out and I want to put it back, it'll go back the same. When that uh, chuck tightens up on a piece of wood, it is not all uniform that it's tightening on. You got face grain, you got end grain, you may have a knot, you may have everything. And one or two jaws are going to sink in deeper than the other two. So if you put it in there, tighten it down good, loosen it, retighten it a time or two, and then go ahead and make your jig. From then on, every time you put it in, if you line it up with the same marks, you got a, a true running jig. Okay, some woods drill a different hole than other ones. This one is not real tight, but it still will drive it. Maybe it'll drive it. of what, what really made that cut better, I was going in the proper direction. Now I'm going the wrong direction. 
when I was going this way, I was pushing it tight against the jig. Where I'm going now, I'm pulling it away. So I really don't have a choice right now, but I just have to take a, a little slower. Now I have to put a hole in the bottom of that. We're going to take and put a finial on there at the end. I put a 3 16 hole in there. I know most of you have seen this probably, but remember you got play in here. Allow that to center itself before you start to drill and lock her down. Just changing the shape of the house a little bit. I could look in and see how much material I had in the bottom. Now, just look at the difference in the shape for taking an eighth of an inch off the bottom. The whole shape of the house changed. When you're playing with something small like this, uh, a sixteenth makes a world of difference. Today and part of yesterday, everyone was concerned that the LEDs on this machine were, was not working because they couldn't tell what the RPMs were. Uh, RPM is not what you should be worried about. Feet per minute. Surface speed. That's the thing you should be concerned about. If two guys or two kids are standing there with a five foot chunk of rope and they're playing to crack the whip kid in the center, he's going very slow. The kid on the outside is flying. He makes a complete circle. Both kids have gone one revolution. <coughs> Granted, the kid on the outside's flying. He's a 10 inch bull. The kid on the inside, he's just a little eighth inch piece. So that kid has to slow down. This kid has to slow up when it comes to speed surface speed. Um, I think most people are under the assumption that speed will take and solve your your problems. Maybe it's not cutting quite right. I disagree with that. Sometimes you people turn too slow, I will say that. But the majority of times, if they would take the tool and walk over to that grinder and put an edge on it, it'll cut much better. I can cut with the lathe off just turning it, so I mean it's not going too slow. But I'm sure there's somebody here that's run a plow before, right? You know, you go along with a plow and if you go too slow, it turns that dirt, o turns that dirt over and just drops it. It does not, it just picks it up and drops it. If you go too fast, it throws it in the other furrow. If you go right, it lays it upside down, which you're looking for. So basically, that's what you're looking for here, is where everything works for you, where you're turning easy. Uh, I can probably turn at a higher speed than you can because my movements are, are that way. But if you're going to err, err on the side of slow, slowing it down rather than going too fast. Besides, going slower is a lot cheaper than bridge work. Putting a, a little flat on the bottom where that finial is going to attach, and it's a little concave on top of it. Now, if if I was uh, finishing this, I would put finish on it right now. OK, 
Okay, we're going to move on to the roof. I have, saying how I'm not going to put all the gingerbread on it, I have my entire roof here. If I was going to put all the pieces together, this would only be maybe an inch long at the most, maybe a little less. If I was going to put the gingerbread, my first step would be to face this off as flat as I could make it. Then I would take a piece of whatever contrasting wood I'm going to use. I would bump that on a sander to get it flat and make sure that it, it goes on there and sticks. What do I mean stick? If it's flat, it's difficult to slide. It just wants to hang. If you can just slide it all around real easy, you're not flat. So I want that as flat as I can have it, then I would glue that on. Then I would continue just like I am now. Now I like to go underneath and make a, a hollow for like an eave. Now this tenon right here, I'm going to turn that down to three quarters because that's the size that's in our, our house. And that's going to align and hold the, the house to the roof. I'm going to take a small parting tool and go in and establish that diameter. Getting close. Okay, now, I'm pretty close on my diameter, if anything, a little loose, but I like to put the house into the roof so it makes a nice joint around the house. So I've got my small parting tool, and I'll... Getting real close, and... If I have too big of a gap, all I have to do is go deeper with it and it'll close that up. Because of the shape of the house coming up, it gets farther down, it gets wider. Okay, it still has just a little gap around it, so I'll make it just a little deeper. There we've got a pretty good fit all the way around it. Seeing how we're making a, a light one, we might as well make an attic in it. I'll just go in and hollow that out. And what good does that do? Makes me happy. I've got a, a scraper that looks like a skew. It is a skew, but the way I use it, I stand it up and make that surface 90 degrees to my work. That way you've, it acts exactly like a scraper. It just looks like I'm gonna kill myself, that's all. But it's really, when you're using it, it puts it in such a, a plane that it is nothing more than a scraper. Okay, at this point, I would take and sand that out and put my finish on it. 
Now you remember we've got a different um, color on here now. At that point I would turn this around, but I'm gonna have to get rid of some of this wood first and then I'll, I'll go ahead about how I, about the shortness of the other piece. You always want to stop short at a chuck because it makes a horrible sound when you run the tool into it. How do I know that? I teach classes. <laughs> Now to turn that around, I have made a jig for the roof. And again, we're going to use that three-quarter inch diameter. What it does, this piece or the tenon goes on the inside and the outside goes into that groove. Uh, it doesn't matter which is holding it, but hopefully it would be that tenon because that's what holding the, the roof or the house to the roof. So in other words, we're, we went from three quarters to three quarters to three quarters. Now, if you change the whole size, I mean, it just, you just change everything here. Make a, another uh, chuck. Now, I contend wood holds better than any material for making jam chucks. This one I've got a piece of nylon on. I do a, a lot of demos, so I use my jam chucks up. They, they get burnished. Um, all kinds of things. When I first started, I said, well, why not use a piece of PVC? You know, that's plentiful and cheap. And so I made it with that, and it worked fine until you spin it once. Once you spin it, it has such a low heat um, melting point that it takes and just ruins it immediately. So I try with nylon, and nylon works pretty decently. I went to Ireland a few weeks ago and I was demoing over there so it's pretty hard to take your chucks on the plane you know they, they add up weight in a hurry and I can't leave them there because my wife brings back more weight you know <laughs> so anyway I says well I'll have to make new jigs when I get there uh, I said, no, I won't. So I made my jig with a number two Morris taper. All I got to do is jam it in the, the headstock, and I've got a, a running jig. Smart, huh? I go walking into the place, and there sets an old record lathe with a number one taper in it. <laughs> and, oh. <laughs> But he says, that's not your lathe. I got another one for you. So, <laughs> so it worked out fine anyway. But <clears throat> Actually, this one sets up better than the other one. I've got a couple of them. You never are perfect with what you do. And sometimes one will fit better than another. 
As you can tell, it sounds like it's home pretty good, but it's not. Thank you. Now, you might as well expect that occasionally because it's going to happen to you. That's better. <clears throat> if I was doing all the fancy work now, this would only be three quarters of an inch or an inch at the longest. And I would face it off to whatever I need, whatever I my my style is at that time. Maybe it might be down to three quarters or it might be five eighths, it wouldn't matter. Then I take a piece of ebony that I have bumped on the disc sander and I glue that on. Then I would take and turn the diameter and then turn down to whatever thickness I want. And believe me, you have to do it a step at a time or they're not going to come out. There'll be one side will be wider than another. And, you know, if you think you're going to put this all together and then put it on as a unit, it doesn't seem to work. Once I had my ebony where I wanted it, I would take and do a piece of holly the same way and bring it down to whatever thickness I wanted. Then I would take a piece of whatever I had put underneath the roof as an accent piece. I would put a, maybe a quarter of an inch of that on there. Then I would put a piece of the box elder for a little uh, bead on there. And on top of that, I would put the remaining piece of whatever my accent wood is. Okay, now that's all glued together. You come to a point of uh, bringing it down to a small diameter and you don't have a lot of glue surface. I mean, you've cut everything away and all you got is this little bit of glue. So what I do is I run a dowel down through there. Even on the burl, burl gets very, um, how would I say, you can uh, bend it around pretty easy because there's no grain in a, uh, in a proper direction. Sometimes it just reach up and you can snap it off. So I like to put a, a dowel down through it also. Okay, this is gonna come off on me. And like I said, you might as well get used to that. Sometimes you can drill all the way, especially the harder woods are great. Okay, she's drilled all the way through. <clears throat> if it vibrates at all, and sometimes they do, nature to beast, you're, you're bound to pull that baby off of there. So that's why I was saying before, everything is, is squared up so that it fits back on there right. People look at me funny when I take a micrometer in to the hardware store to buy dowels. And they're never right anyway, so. Now I would have to drive that in there and that's not the way to do it.
I used the medium density glue on this, and I would suggest that you take it off the jig. If you get the glue on the inside of the jig, it's kind of hard to get it cleaned up and off of there again. So. I could just put it on and rotate the, the dowel and it kind of spreads it on the inside. One time you can do this and it never comes off and the next time it the nature of the beast to do that. <laughs> Okay, we're going to have to put a, a means of holding this up. And I have a real small screw eyelet that goes in there. But one of the things that bugs me is if I wait till I'm done, I never seem to hit that dead center. So I use a little pin vise. Pin vise is used in a large or a chuck that won't go down to the small sizes. You know, maybe they, some of your big machine chucks stop at eighth of an inch. So this is much smaller. Um, I use the pin vise just to hold it. Just let it find its center. And I put a hole in there. Now the, the reason I do it again at this time, everything is now turned around that hole. So when I'm done, it should all be centered right, that hole should be centered to the remainder of the roof. Always put a bead in here. When I put the pieces all together, I don't have a choice as to where it's going to go. Here, I can shift it one way or the other, just to suit my my fancy. You can hear how thin that is. Now that bead, when it goes on there, 
I like to have the the spiral of the roof go right on through it looking like it's one piece. little skew will go down that and probably make a, the best cut. You have to kind of watch yourself when you do the the finish and finish cuts. You got an eighth of an inch dowel going through there, so there's really not a lot of material between that dowel and the surface. So yes, occasionally they do come through. finish that end of that roof. And we've got the roof on our house. Now we got to make a little finial for it to sit on the bottom. I want to take and make it to where it fits that flat. This is the kit in the center that's holding the rope. It's going slow, so you want it, you want that slower, smaller diameter to speed up. That little cove in there, that's always a, a hard one for me to get. But what I get, I like to take my little uh, quarter inch square round nose, stand it up on a 45 and come in here and just take and cut that off. Did a poor job on that. Must be getting late on Sunday. I don't know if you noticed what I did right there. I went down in a normal cut. When I got to the bottom of that, I just rolled it a little bit and sheer scraped it out. So I just made a all in one motion rather than trying to go down and meet it at the middle.
Now I have to put a 3 16 tenon on here. When you sand this, I've been trying to put, you know, some detail into it and I try to be very careful that I don't sand it all out. Now we got our finial on there. All we need is a roost. I like to go on the end and leave just a little bit of a sweep. That way everybody knows I've been there with the tool. You know, it's just not haphazard. And now this has to be an eighth of an inch. You know, it looks like it's really getting down there, but it's not. Okay, that time I think we did it. Here we have our completed birdhouse. One of the things I do when I do glue it together, I use like tight bond. Uh, I don't use cyanacrylate because if you do and get any on the surface, it's ruined. Um, I buff it before I put it together. Can't get underneath that roof when it's together. So I buff it and whack, put wax on it and then I take and put my house together.